And I think had we had proper use of public service money to do investigative journalism in this country, we should have become much more aware of some of the corruption that was going on in this country. We have minimal amount of investigative journalism, sadly. Mm -hmm. And it's only going to get worse. Well, you, so, you know. Well, newspapers have uh, fired off before their own stuff on the back of the investigation that they have done. Yeah, I know. They did I know. two years ago, and if I just took yours as one. Sorry? They were in, in, in yeah. yeah. But, so, because of the links between developers between and the paper, and papers. On top of which, the BBC has a whole department called Editorial Policy. I worked for the BBC also for 10 years. A department called Editorial Policy, which is about ensuring editorial independence and proper rigour. There's a great big book about the rules and regulations about how to treat children, how to treat animals, how to treat politicians, how to treat advertising. You name it, it's in the book. Is there a book like that in RTE? No. We kind of make it up. People make it up as they go along. Most of the time, of course, they get it right. But then, because they don't have, again, they don't have any rules either. They don't have any guidelines, they don't have anything set that says you are accountable. The money we give you, it's your license fee. And we used to have a thing at the BBC, <coughs> we'd say how many license fees did we spend today? So if you overnighted in a hotel, it was one license fee. And if you ate a large breakfast, it was a tenth of a license fee. But you know what, that was quite a good way to concentrate your mind and make sure you were spending, you know, the license payer's money. And RTE doesn't have the same level of accountability at editorial level that it ought to have, and in its own interest, it yeah. would be a better organisation if it had that. And I see. I think people aren't aware of this. Sorry now to just not, no, hijack the, the argument, but if we had proper investigative journalism in this country, and we don't, we would have more exposures of, this, of these stories. There would be more outrage, because the media is powerful, and you only see how the media use things like the medical card scheme and the Jamie Murphy case in Cromlin Children's Hospital to see how the politicians then will take note. But I'll give you a very quick example before I, I, I take more right. of your, uh, your issue. I'll come back to that, Dan, Dan in one second. Um, there was a story recently, and I haven't confirmed this with TV3, but it was in some of the newspapers. Vincent Brown's show, I'm, I'm not a major fan of Vincent, but fair dues to TV3 for putting on a, 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 a current affairs discussion program late at night. To begin with, it wasn't necessarily something that was going to earn them a lot of money. Um, and obviously, they have suffered recently. But Brown's show was the only one at that time on television. RTE were not doing something like this. Uh, questions and answers, they used to haul out the same people every single week and they would isolate people like myself and other people. We were not allowed on Q&A because we were with commercial broadcasting stations. This is how they operate. This is where your public service license fee is going. Vincent Brown's show got sponsorship from, I think, the Bank of Scotland. The BCI, the Broadcasting Commission of Ireland, came down on TV3 and said, if you are going to get sponsorship for a current affairs program, you have to change it into a light entertainment program because you're not allowed, seriously. Because under the rules, commercial television stations, they have an obligation to broadcast news and current affairs programs, but they can't get any other funding to keep them going. This is an, at a time when RT has a license fee to be able to subsidise its own, its own operations and TV3 is struggling with advertising revenue. It, it's ridiculous. It's an aberration. And, I, you know, I wish more people could understand what this is doing to our journalism as well. If RTE were a, a sort of a pillar of fabulous investigative journalism, that they've done us a great service, that they're not paying, you know, presenters vast sums of money which have no correlation to other broadcasting organisations elsewhere, then I'd say, OK, fair enough. But really, as, as OK. somebody who is a fan of Rinson Brand, <laughs> Good. Uh, yes. Uh, quick is, uh, funding is only yeah. half of it if people had the neck just to publish, publish and be damned. You know, but there's actually not a whole lot of courage around. Yeah. Because they're Sorry. afraid of, of legal. Can I try to bring this back to the original question? Because yes. we've run yeah. the broadcasting <laughs> ethic now. And we, we obviously need investigative uh, journalism. We don't have enough of it. There are factors that are preventing it. But what also prevents uh, the, the access to the public to engage and have proper information is the lack of a functioning parliamentary democracy. Yeah. And we started off the debate talking about the role of the Gion Corla. Uh, and I, I sometimes think, shocking in all as the uh, revelations are about uh, expenses, uh, the real questions should be asked if we're interested in reforming our society is that why isn't the Gion Corla doing the type of role that Gion Corla is meant to be doing as an independent representative of the people, making sure that ministers answer questions that are asked directly of them so we don't get 
get situations like the Beef Tribunal, that we don't get situations like the, uh, the, the tribunals we're seeing in Dublin Castle at the moment, and that's where reform has to happen. That's where the questions aren't being asked. But the second point I'd like to raise is that if you go back to our most recent set of elections, uh, what we need to, to face again as a people is that when these issues are put out there by individual politicians and by other political parties, the reform agenda does not look, get a look in. Part of it is because of media, but part of it is that people make their decisions in general elections because of the money in their pocket. And that's what happened in 2007. And what you need to be talking about at meetings like this is that how do we stop future general elections being about that, about the issues of clientelism and, and uh, individual economic self-interest. Okay. Very quickly, because we want to take a quick break, just very quick responses, Paul. I think the main problem in this country is social partnership. Social partnership functions in Ireland, where the House of Lords functions in Britain. You get co-opted into it, and you are corrupted by it because you are, you are at the table, and therefore you don't get opposition. I mean, how many people who voted for the Greens at the last election really thought it would be their problem to forward in the situation that we're in now? You know, there is actually no, what we don't have in Ireland are checks and balances. And it's checks and balances that happen in, in you know, civil societies, really civil societies, and the concept of it in terms of a law-based system, really invented by the English in the modern era, and championed by the Americans. I mean, we all know about freedom of speech. It's really the only game in town in journalism is freedom of speech. But unfortunately, we have a BCI and a media policy, and as some of the left, by the way, you know, who think that media is all about empowerment and, and, and all that nonsense, when in fact it's about scrutiny, and it's about freedom of speech that is the only game in town. And so people in Ireland get co-opted into the partnership system because we are mesmerized by power. Okay. So what we need is all Okay. Do you, do you want to take one more comment, John, or should we, or uh, we go for a break? We have a second panel. Just yeah. I'll just make this point at first break. Yeah. Lest, lest anyone think we're censoring uh, our panelists, <laughs> we do have a second panel who will focus on restoring trust in business, making Ireland a good place to invest. It's a very... Uh, very much a, a, a live issue and one that, that, that I think um, we would all benefit from um, hearing our, our panellists speak on. Um, so we, we can take... Colby <coughs> just wants to take, make a one, one more comment yeah. and we'll run into the next session in about five minutes, five, ten minutes, we break for coffee yeah. and uh, okay. we will move on from there. Uh, I, I want to pick up on uh, something that, that Susan said. Uh, whilst... Uh, putting systems in place that have very different standards of transparency and accountability is absolutely essential. How do you get when good people put up their hands and say, we want to become champions of good politics? A lot can be done there proactively. What happens is quite often people like Susan get into it and then the rules of the game informally corrupt them over time as well. Uh, but the champions of good politics can proactively say, we're not going to play according to those rules. We will proactively and publicly put asset declarations out there. We would, we would publicly, before we are elected, put declaration of our business interests into the public domain. Okay, now. Uh, there's a lot that can be done by good champ champions of good politics even before they enter politics, that will change the game as well. Okay, thank you so much, Cobus. Now, so Justine, Susan, and Cobus are leaving us, but you may be staying in the audience. So thank you very much. Dan is staying on.